DiscerningHearts.com presents Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors. I'm your host, Chris McGregor, and I am delighted to be joined by Mary Dudrow-Gordon, who translated the work Salt and Light, written by Bernadette Chauvelin. In Salt and Light, Bernadette Chauvelin explores the lives of Elizabeth and Felix Lasseur, who lived in France as a carefree young couple with a bright future ahead of them. They were beautifully and compatibly matched, except for one major difference. Elizabeth was a devout Catholic, and Felix was a firmly decided atheist. As they faced the seasons of life together, their relationship was tested, and both were called to a deep spiritual transformation. With Mary Dudrow Gordon, we go inside the pages of Bernadette Chauvelin's Salt and Light, The Spiritual Journey of Elizabeth and Felix Lazur, published by Ignatius Press. Mary, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. What a delight to be able to have Salt and Light, The Spiritual Journey of Elizabeth and Felix Lazur. This wonderful book describes one of the great, uh, truly beautiful romance experiences that I think so many people would benefit from learning from. Yeah, Elizabeth and her husband had a beautiful marriage, and that's something really highlighted in the book is their sort of enduring love for each other and also just their their friendship. They really had a strong meeting of the minds and shared a lot of interests and they really talked to each other and confided in each other and traveled together. And yeah, they were really each other's best friends. I am so appreciative that you've done such a beautiful job at translating the work of its author, Bernadette Chauvelin, who as it says in the book, she's a doctor of letters and philosophy, and she specializes in the psychology and spirituality of marriage. This story really is an incredible the experience of marriage. Is. Yes, it definitely, I would say, raises the bar on sort of, you know, the understanding of a sacramental marriage and what that's really supposed to accomplish over time for each person in the marriage. And there's really this very strong testament to um, this, this goal of working for each other's souls in the marriage and that your marriage, you know, is going to be the saving grace for both of you. And that's not something that I think we reflect on often enough. Many people may not have seen their marriage is a quote-unquote sacramental marriage in the beginning, only because Felix was not a man of the church, shall we say. This was not something that spoke to him, at least at this time. But as you said, you know, there is such a great love between them, and we do know that God is love, right? I mean, that's what St. John tells us in his letters, that, you know, who is God? God is love. So when there is such a beautiful love, he truly is present in a very real way, isn't he? Yes, and I think that is supposed to, especially through the example of Elizabeth and Felix, is supposed to kind of encourage us all that where there is love, there is God, and there is grace. And so what you see with Elizabeth and Felix, even though there was this kind of deep struggle over religion because they really did love each other and never stopped serving each other and being considerate of one another and making sacrifices for each other, their relationship stood fast because they had that love. There are a lot of us who may have kids already who are adults who may be in marriages, but they don't look like the typical, oh, sacramental marriage as they start out. You you want your kids to be married in the church. I guess we could say that. And sometimes parents can get into a type of despair because that hasn't happened. And this story in particular says, hey, but don't give up hope. Don't give up praying. Don't stop loving because there's a fruitfulness that we may not be able to anticipate in this present moment, but maybe God is doing something greater in that union. That was very much Elizabeth's approach to her own prayer life was she had this complete trust 
in the Lord that, you know, he had a plan. He was in control. He was going to hear her prayers for Felix's conversion. He was going to make their marriage fruitful and bring both of them close to him. She really believed that it was kind of her sacred duty to pray and offer sacrifices for Felix's conversion. But she also understood that his conversion would not be of her doing, but of God's. And so she was also detached from a a sense of like time or this has to happen in this certain way or whatever. You know, it was like she really did trust God that in God's time, Felix would have his conversion and come back to the church. Well, let's talk about these two remarkable people, Elizabeth and Felix. Set the stage for us. Yeah, this is when they meet. It's, you know, it's like the 18... 80s, which is kind of that beginning of what's known as La Belle Epoque in Paris. And there's just so much going on. It's kind of a whirlwind of excitement in the art world and the political world and the technological world. One of the things that they do in 1900 is they go to the World's Fair in Paris, the Great Exhibition. There's a lot of, um, yeah, just very exciting change going on. And it, there's still this sort of old European ethos very much still alive. And so they actually, you know, are able to go to, like, when, they're, when they first meet and then they're kind of getting to know each other, they go to, like, some balls together, you know. So there's really this kind of sense of sort of old world romance, which adds, I think, a lot of charm to their story. And yeah, they they meet in their early 20s and they just, they were introduced by a mutual friend who thought, you know, was like, oh, I, you know, they could, they thought maybe it would be a good match. And, and they really just hit it off. They had so much to talk about and so much in common. And they came from very similar family backgrounds and they just clicked, you know, and it was like, it just made sense for, for them. And, and so yeah, they, they they got married and, and then their early married life, too, was sort of very exciting, lots of travel. And they were part of a very intellectual and political social circle in Paris. And they really enjoyed a very active social life kind of at the center of all of this exciting change. And then that's something that they kind of have to figure out how to balance, you know, with their their marriage and their other responsibilities and for Elizabeth, her spiritual life. And it's really a, it's a wonderful story of, of how they kind of navigate marriage and all the trials that come with it. This is a time when these two young people are, this is a time in particularly Paris and France. People are trying to figure out what can anchor civilization what can bring a new balance, a new understanding. So there was a lot of talk, a lot of thinking. And Felix was very much, he was very engaged in all all of this. What is the world? What should it look like? How should it act? How can we grow and be better than we've been? And, you know, that's kind of the world that he's in, isn't it? Definitely. He started out as a medical student. So he was first involved in sort of, you know, the cutting edge of what's happening in science. And then he transitions to journalism, political journalism specifically, and he is very interested in sort of France's colonial ambitions. And he definitely is very, I would say, optimistic about the future. And that, I think that's something that we could see with our own sort of obsession with progress in our time now, this like progress is going to happen and humanity is going to be better for it. And religion has no place here because, you know, human improvement has nothing to do with any kind of spiritual uh, reality. It's completely material. It's scientific. And Felix, I think, would kind of share that sort of ambition that humanity can progress from sort of a technological standpoint. Yeah, so much was happening in the world. I mean, this is the time of the rise of the sciences and and understanding how things take place. This is, in so many ways, you can look at today, the rise of technologies. 
you can travel the world. You can take your spouse with you. You can experience everywhere from different corners of the world. So much easier to get around. Yeah, as you said, a time of great optimism for so many in his particular age group. Yes, and they were able to experience a lot of those new changes. I mean, they traveled extensively across Europe. They went to Russia. That was a a new uh, kind of itinerary that you could take more easily with the railroad. And they really, you know, yeah, were able to experience a lot of these technological benefits. And so it's kind of interesting that, you know, he's met with someone who enjoys and appreciates all of these advancements that genuinely do a lot of good. But Elizabeth also is able to have the perspective that change in of itself isn't good if the human heart is not also changed. Mm. Yeah, Elizabeth, this young girl, this beautiful woman who he fell in love with and shared a very tender love. A very he Felix looked at her as as you can see from the book, very tenderly. He cares about her and her enthusiasm about and love for him is very real. In, in the beginning of the book we begin to see though, even as she might have gotten caught up in his I will say it again, enthusiasm, she is brought down low with illness isn't she? I mean, she endured in those first few years, a great deal of unanticipated suffering. Yes, yeah, she had liver disease, which was sort of a chronic um, kind of manifestation where she would have these bouts of sickness where she would be bedridden for weeks and connect may possibly connected with that she and around the same time she kind of learned she wouldn't be able to have children so very early in their marriage I think it was like three months into their marriage when she had this first round of of sickness and you know it was like very early on their marriage was sort of marked by they would have limitations and she especially would have these very severe physical limitations and the way that they both handle that you know she resigns herself on a spiritual level and Felix he takes such beautiful care of her throughout their entire marriage. He's so thoughtful, considerate. He gives up his dream job so that they can lit, stay living where they're living, be close to family. He really puts her first, I would say. It's unexpected in a way that he would, at this young age, want to continue to care and love her and dismissing the possibilities of maybe having children, that this was not his priority. The priority for him, and it really comes through in the book, is his love for her. Yeah, and the way that both of them are able to, you know, take that suffering of not being able to have children and just share their love with everyone else in their life. And, you know, they're very close to their nieces and nephews and very generous to all of their relatives and how they care for them. And so the fact that both of them, yeah, were so kind of united on that, that they were going to accept not being able to have children so graciously and then to pour that love out to the people they did have in their life is really a beautiful witness to, again, this kind of trust that life is bigger than we are. Oh, I just love every bit of salt and light, the spiritual journey of Elizabeth and Felix Lasser. I have to say, Mary, that when I first heard about Elizabeth and Felix Lasser, it was that she was a woman of faith, and he was a stubborn atheist. This is why the book is so important for people and to get to really know the deeper the more examined life of some saints, because sometimes in our minds, we can make these caricatures of people who we may perceive that they're an atheist and that they just, they dismiss God and they don't care and make them almost cartoonish in a way yeah. without getting to know the person. In this book, you really get to understand not only Elizabeth, but you really begin to see a fuller picture of who Felix was. Yeah, I think that's something that's really remarkable about their story and, and how it's told here in this book, especially, is that, yeah, the author, she really wanted to show that both of these people were just so good to their core. 
you know, and that Felix's struggles with belief were first of all completely understandable considering, you know, the time and the place and the influences and the trends. Secondly, that yeah, his his struggle with belief, that's a perfectly human struggle and that doesn't negate someone's ability to to be loving or kind. He yeah, he does not turn into this kind of boorish, oh the wicked husband kind of caricature. No, he's a good, he's a fantastic husband. And so, yeah, to have that perspective of belief and faith is, is a struggle and it's a struggle for Elizabeth too, you know, and that's a very real experience. I think that is important to highlight that holiness is a, is an extended journey and it's sort of a constant back and forth between you and God and you and the people in your life. I mean, he is an example of someone we may know today in our own life, and not to be quick to judge, because there, as Elizabeth, there's such great hope and trust that God will do the work. And so throughout this entire book, we, because of the the journey they take, they have moments of struggle. And she would so much like him to share the faith with her. But he's just not there. She continues to love and to give strength, even in a way that has to be quiet sometimes, doesn't she? Yes, she talks about in her in her writings, you know, in her diary, she calls it her duty of silence. And she takes that approach with everyone in her life who is not a believer, which was most of their friends. And she really has this understanding that you know, conversion is at the heart. And so she doesn't try to evangelize the people in her life from a sort of, you know, verbal argumentative approach. She believes that, you know, just by loving them for who they are, accepting them for who they are, and praying for them in secret, that is the best way to let God work on their hearts through her. And again, she's so, she's so detached from, I need to, you know, I need to convert this person. She absolutely does not have that mindset at all. She is fully trusting that it's God who will touch their heart in his own time. And I'm just here to love them and be a witness to God's love. I guess that's the message for us too. I refer to him as an atheist, and really, I mean, at heart, he was an agnostic. He just, he just wanted proof. He essentially just wanted to, you know, okay, well, show me then. And that's what she did, just by loving him. If God is love, and she gave that love, in a very real way, there is a type of communion for him. Every day, every moment, she was with him. And that did a, that is an incredible grace that touched him, didn't it? Yes, it did. And especially when he read her diary after her death and her other writings, her, you know, letters that she had saved and letters she'd written to other people and her journals from, she kept a journal even as a little girl. So she had kind of a lifetime of writings when he read her writings and and then learned of all the sacrifices that she had made for him so discreetly and the tremendous faith that she had had in his goodness and his conversion, he's so humbled by that and really, I mean, you know, shocked in a way by how much suffering she offered up for him. And that example of love as well in addition to, you know, her affection for him and the, you know, the home that she made for him, but to learn this kind of deeper level to what her interior life and her interior love for him. I mean, that really like, you know, it just bowls him over. If you mentioned her death, and I think that's one of the most poignant chapters in the book. It's when disease conquers the whole of life that experience is, of course, they've been married for 25 years. And 
during that time, she continues to pray, and that's the big chunk of the book is their life and what it looked like and what they're experiencing. But when it comes to the point where she's about to die, even then, she is now praying to a little Carmelite named Therese. She's not a saint yet, not a blessed yet. Even at that, Felix kind of looks at it and just doesn't understand it, doesn't get it, does he? No, he, you know, he tries towards the end of her life. He definitely was more supportive, I would say, of her, you know, going to mass and her being, because, you know, just he could see that that brought her so much consolation in her illness. So he became, I would say, more supportive at that point. And, you know, she had a close friendship with a Dominican priest who ministered to her at the end of her life and was there to kind of give her last rites and everything. But yeah, Felix is still kind of just an observer, you know, he's on the outside. He doesn't, he doesn't share her, her trust that, that God is real, that God is there, that God is the one who's guiding life and authoring life. And it's interesting how after her death, Felix does start to have these experiences where God's presence, he starts to really actually feel that for the first time in his adult life. And so it's just so interesting, you know, timing is a mystery, right? Why did it have to be after her death? But then you see this kind of beautiful second part of the story where she dies and opens up this doorway for Felix to have not just a conversion, but a second life you know, as a priest for 30 years. I mean, that is just amazing that he's really given a second chance to live a full life in service of God. That's really remarkable. I can't help but think of the mystery of divine mercy. We hear about that so often that you have to trust in that mercy of God and his grace and to see what he's doing. And that's in a very real way, Elizabeth did that, didn't she? She did. She really trusted that God has, you know, the full picture. We only have little slivers of it. And she, she herself had a few moments in her life where she kind of just hands herself over to God. And those moments in the book, I think are really beautiful as well, that again, that you know, that personal relationship with God is a sort of continuous and continuously evolving relationship. And to see these kind of different moments of surrender, um, to sort of reaffirm that trust in God, those are important moments for her to stay strong in her faith and to, um, you know, have that reassurance that, okay, whatever's happening right now in my life that I don't understand or that's difficult or painful, I'm just going to put my trust back in God. And that always renews her strength and her purpose and gives her comfort. The spiritual testament is the letter that she wrote Felix nine years before her own death. She knows she's going to die, right? She doesn't know when, but she writes this spiritual testament. What was it like for you I mean, you have to get to really enter into Elizabeth's heart to be able to find the right words that translate her meaning. I think you did a beautiful job. I think it's a beautiful translation of that letter. Oh, thank you. That's actually my favorite part in the whole book. And I I reread that part many times, actually, because it's such a striking, it's such a striking work of just who she was and what her spirituality was like. She says to Felix, you know, love souls, pray, suffer, and work for them. They deserve all of our sorrows and efforts and sacrifices. And it's like, I feel like that is just so, that to me is so radical because I think sometimes we have this sense of, oh, this person needs something from me. Oh, it's such a drag. Oh, I have to do another thing. You know, it's like sometimes we have this really stingy attitude about love and giving of ourselves. And here she's saying, they deserve this. Like, 
all souls deserve love, which means it's not a big deal for you to love. That's just what they deserve. Like, that's just, that's just what everybody deserves. That's like the basic, you know, is to just love people. It's not like, oh, I'm doing something huge extra. It's like, no, this is the fundamental human right, if you will, to be loved. And that to me is just so like, wow. (laughs) It is wow. If you don't mind, I'm going to read the last paragraph because I think that it's such a great commissioning. I think it is for all of us, but I hope that everyone will pick up a copy of this book because it is so good. It is just so hope-filled. But what Elizabeth puts in the Spiritual Testament, the last paragraph, she says, And now, my beloved Felix, I repeat to you my unique and great tenderness. I commission you to repeat to our family, to our friends, how much I have loved them all and how much I will pray for them until the hour of reunion. Near God, where other loved ones already await us, we will one day be eternally reunited. I hope for it through my trials offered for you and through divine mercy. Your wife forever, Elizabeth. Now she has this hid away. She writes it nine years before the moment it would be taken out and given to Felix. It's, it is so beautiful. Imagine what, <laughs> Imagine how he received that. Imagine those thoughts and those feelings as he grieved for the, the loss of the love of his life. There's a place further in the book when he's talking about what, it, what the experience was like to read her writings. And he says, once more, God was resplendent before my eyes. And you get that there's almost like a Dante Beatrice kind of image there where it's the beauty of her soul is allowing him to see the beauty of God. And that is such a powerful message for us, you know, that, that God's grace shining through us when, when we love others, you know, that like enables people to see God when we love them they see God, maybe without even knowing it at first, you know, but like that is such a powerful uh, and inspiring, like that makes me want to go love people, you know? That's good. I think someone told you to do that. His name is Jesus. That's <laughs> very important. And it, it, it just exemplifies this beauty of what our vocation is. And I was speaking with Kimberly Hahn not too long ago, and she reminded me of something that our vocation is not the vocation of marriage. Our vocation actually has a name. In my case, my vocation's name is Bruce. And my number one job is to get him to heaven. And likewise, his vocation's name is Chris. And in this case, in this book, you really see it. For Elizabeth, she believed her vocation's name was Felix. And he lived that out as well. She didn't fret as more than she trusted it's so beautiful how this book really brings that forward for people. And ultimately, you know, I mean, as, as opposed to someone who just doesn't believe strong enough in God's grace and may have to feel they need to nag their husband into heaven. That usually doesn't work, right. doesn't Mary? <laughs> Nagging the husband to heaven. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But um, I don't think it works for anybody, you know, yep. and I think that's something that she understood is, while Felix was kind of her top priority, she took the same approach to everyone in her life where she, you know, we should want everyone to go to heaven. And the best way to get them there is to sort of pray them in. That's right. That's right. And like she said, in divine mercy, trust. You know, that's the one thing Jesus is always saying, trust in me. Just trust me. And Elizabeth is a a great example of someone who did. And the footnote to the story, he became a Dominican priest, once studying to become a doctor, and he was an accomplished journalist. He became a Dominican priest. How about that? Yep. He had a full, very full life as a priest. 
Elizabeth and was able to take what he had learned from Elizabeth and then sort of reciprocate it through his ministry as a priest, which is also a beautiful reminder, I think, that nothing is wasted, you know? And even though, you know, even though he couldn't share the faith with Elizabeth, he's able to share the faith that he and Elizabeth now share after her death with all of these other people. And so there's just this sense of abundance. Yeah, how about that? Isn't that remarkable? Elizabeth is a servant of God now, whose cause for canonization is moving forward, hopefully even more so with the the help of this beautiful book. Yeah, we hopefully um, her cause will kind of get back underway. Felix was the one who opened it in 1936. And after his death, I think it stalled a bit. So hopefully it can um, sort of be revived because I think she's a wonderful example for our time. It's, it's amazing how they have a tendency sometimes these causes stall out in a certain period of time, and then they're brought forward once again, particularly at a time when the church, the world, needs that saint. And I would say maybe yeah. in this case, these saints, this married couple. But Yes, definitely. Mary, I, I wish we had more time. Uh, any final thoughts? Just from my own personal experience of, you know, translating the book, and I didn't know anything about the Listeurs before I, I translated the book, but I guess something that I really enjoyed about the book as I was reading it and sort of thinking on it was just the encounter that you are able to have from reading the book with this couple, with these two amazing people and I think their example is just very ordinary in many ways and therefore very powerful because you have this encounter with them that is subtle in a lot of ways and the subtlety of it allows the you know, the power of their example to, I think, resonate even more deeply, maybe, you know, it doesn't, it's not a shock experience on the surface of like, oh my gosh, that's a crazy saint, like, who, you know, who is just like way out there holy. They're so normal. And that was something that really touched me because I saw just the normalcy of their life and the ordinary nature of kind of their marriage. And they're just regular people who are able to take their love and see it in this bigger picture. And that really struck me and I, that inspired me. And I, I hope that will inspire other people that to see that all of us are called to this holiness with who we are and in our own personal lives. It's a story of faith, hope, and love. And the greatest thing that shines through this whole thing is their love and his love, God's love. It's really just absolutely wonderful. Mary, thank you for the beautiful job you did translating this wonderful work by Bernadette Chauvelin, Salt and Light. It's difficult to have a good translation. I've read some really bad ones, (laughs) and they can destroy a a story or a thought. Yours brought an even greater light to it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and I'm so glad that you enjoyed the book. With Mary Dudrow Gordon, we've gone inside the pages of Bernadette Chauvelin's Salt and Light, The Spiritual Journey of Elizabeth and Felix Lesur. To learn more about this book or to obtain a copy, go to ignatius.com, the website for its publisher, Ignatius Press. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore to hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find it on the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. Most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Inside the Pages, insights from today's most compelling authors.